So give it up for him. You know. um, as you can see, he's the director of player personnel and strategy, and we're going to have a discussion here. Like I said, uh, to those of you who were here earlier, we're going to open it up for questions throughout. Raise your hand, and uh, you know, Issa or I will make sure to get to you, but then we'll have a Q&A session afterwards if there's any questions, and um, feel free to stick around after as well. So. We're just going to get started here. We'll sit down, and we're just going to go through. Um, and I'm going to sit up here and ask you some questions. Feel free to butt in whatever you guys have on as well. So, um, first of all, thank you for sitting down with me. And I want to get started. Just start from the beginning. Uh, you know, you're very soccer oriented. Your whole career has been in soccer. When did you first fall in love with soccer, and uh, how early did you start playing? First of all, thank you for having me, Andy. Thank you all for making the time to come here. I really appreciate it, and it's an honor to be here. If you cannot hear me, you know, come closer. I won't be offended. Uh, trust me. Uh, to answer your question, um, I mean, based on my accent, you guys uh, realize that I'm not from here. I'm from France. Uh, my parents are from Senegal. Uh, which is a That's the only sport. I mean, there are other sports such as basketball, handball, but everybody plays soccer. You guys are lucky to play baseball, to play football, basketball, all this stuff, but back home, all you do, you play soccer. And my dad was watching soccer, that's all that was on TV, there was some rugby as well, but as a kid, you just play soccer. And, and, and your friends play soccer, you play soccer at school, you, drop out of, uh, you come out of school, you play soccer, and we can play soccer, so that's all we do. So that's how I feel. I mean, couldn't fully know anything else. Yeah. It had to be soccer. Yeah, uh, you know, I know soccer is huge in Europe. Did you play any other sports growing up or was it mainly soccer? No, that, and that's the thing. Like, all the kids and the kids that were around me, it was just soccer. You, you could play rugby, but that's more plays in, in the south of France. I'm from the east of France. You could play handball, tennis, but at the end of the day, more than 90% of the kids play soccer, so I almost had no choice. Yeah, and uh, you know, I. No, from doing a little bit of research, you played soccer uh, at various levels, including in the academy level in France, correct? And then, yeah. uh, you know, going to uh, NFI University. Yeah. Um, can, you can just talk about your experience as a player, what your, your aspirations were. You know, you made it to the professional uh, as an executive now, which is, uh, you know, you had a wealth of knowledge growing up and playing. You know, what were your goals playing, and how was that experience doing that? I started playing a, as a, you know, I was five. I started playing, and as a five-year-old, you want to be a professional. You want to be like your idol on TV. And, you know, that was a goal of mine when I was very little, but you don't know any better, you just play. But I guess I was, I was talented, I, had, I was pretty good, and I was scouted by uh, some academies some professional clubs. For those that are not familiar, it would be as if you play football here in Columbus and the Cleveland Browns and the Steelers uh, want you to join their, their franchise, their club, to play for their under 14, under 15. So at 13 year old, uh, my parents got some phone calls from professional clubs asking, asking them for me to, to, to join their academies. Um, but initially my parents didn't want me to go. But they said, listen, school is important. Uh, I know you want to be professional, but school is more important than anything. But those clubs told my parents, listen, our goal is for him to be a professional soccer player. We just guarantee him a high school diploma, but after that, we don't care. Our goal is really for him to be a soccer player. So I begged my parents, I need to go. And as always, they've been, they've been great with me, and they said, okay, if, 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 if that's what you want, just go. So at 13 year old, I, I left. 14 actually, I left uh, my parents' house to be at an academy. So I was spending there uh, initially just a week and going home on the weekends. But then it was two weeks, then a month, and it was the best experience of my life just because as a 14 year old, you were in an environment with older kids, kids from abroad, from yeah, all over the world actually, from Israel, uh, South Africa, Canada, 
and I was just so young and 14, and my goal was to be a professional soccer player. Unfortunately, uh, I spent five years there, which I'm proud of, but reaching uh, almost, this, almost the highest level. Right before signing pro, I was with the reserve team, and I was told at the end of the season by my coach, uh, he said, the adventure ends here, his exact word. And it, it's crushing, because it's been my, my, my dream. And, but I, I said, I, I'm not giving up, I'm not giving up. So even if I was released, I tried, I, I, I was looking for tryouts, but it's, it's difficult. It's, uh, it's only 1% of people that make it. It's similar to any professional sport. So I was crushed, but I had to bounce back. But the issue was that there was no other, no other alternative, at least at home in France. It's either you be professional or that's it. You have to work somewhere else. <coughs> Luckily, I came across an article of a guy, a French guy, uh, going to university in the United States. So I tried to do some research. I met up with a person that helped me um, understand how it was here in the US, what it would mean. So I started the, the, the process. Uh, I, 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 I did my SAT like you guys. I did what's called a TOEFL uh, to test your, your level of English, which was really bad for me. Uh, anyway, I got two scholarships, in uh, one in Connecticut and the other one in James Madison something, I can't remember. But I asked the person that was helping me that I wanted to be in New York. And uh, luckily he found Adelphi University, which is a school on Long Island. And said, so, listen, this is a great school. Uh, it's D1. It's rather small, but they're offering you a full ride. I'm like, okay, let's go. So then I ended up joining Adelphi University. Uh, played there three years. I was eligible for three years. I had a great freshman year. Uh, I'm, cut, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna cut it. But I got a great freshman year. I was the second top striker of the country. And after my uh, sophomore and junior year, some MLS clubs were interested in me. They wanted me to try for them. They wanted me to be pro maybe, professional. But at that time, I was done. I was, I was, I was 22, 23. I'm like, I need to make a decision. Do I go to soccer or do I continue school? And I spoke to families and friends, and, and I decided, listen, the goal to be, become professional was in my past. It was back when I was in France. Now I came here to study. I enjoy it. I'm just going to study and, and forget about playing soccer. And I don't regret to this day. Yeah, and it's interesting. Was uh, your time coming over uh, to go to university? Was that one of your first times coming to like the United States uh, to play? Like, had you ever played over here? Had you ever traveled over here? Um, no, I've, I've never come here. You never. never. You never. I've never. Come. I've traveled, yes, in Europe, in Italy, in England. Spain and all these things, but I've never come to the U.S. But the U.S., you know, for for uh, teenagers back home, the U.S. is a dream. We, we watch movies, TV shows. That's all we know about the U.S. Music, and it's it's cool. But we we, we never come here, and yet we, we love this country. And and for me to come was amazing. As uh, you know, stupid thing like a yellow bus. Uh, you know, you you see it in the movies, and then oh wow, yellow bus, that's awesome. Or a, a, a baseball field. Uh, but yeah, I arrived here and I thought I could speak English and no, I couldn't. I, I couldn't be understood, I couldn't understand anything. I was getting dizzy to be honest. It was really tough uh, to begin with, but thank God I had teammates that helped me. And then yeah, and then you just progress and, and, and then I'm still here. Yeah, and uh, you know, I did more research about you. Uh, stayed and coached uh, or how what was the timeline for that because I know there is some coaching in your background yeah. um, and then how did that kind of transition uh, from you know playing staying in the college ranks to uh, entering into your like, professional career which ended up not being playing soccer it being ended up being working in the game so what was that transition like in getting into that so the issue was that I was only eligible to play for three years. Um, but during my playing time, I was coaching you know, individual players. And coming to my fourth year, my coach uh, asked me if I wanted to be an assistant coach. And I said, of course. And that's how I got into coaching. But 
being an assistant coach was great because you can deal with individuals, but I, I knew coaching was not for me just because I didn't want to be the head coach and, and, and having to manage a whole team because that's a whole different beast. And as I told you guys, I had the chance to go either professional or continue studying. I decided to continue studying, but then I had to focus, okay, now what do I do? Um, I was a major in marketing and I always loved advertising and I wanted to be in advertising. Up until the day we visited an ad agency in New York City and I saw how they were working and I'm like, this is not for me, I, I can't do that. And I've always been a sport guy, or a soccer guy. I'd like to work in soccer, if not at least in sport. And that's when I applied to a, a major league office um, headquarters in New York City for an internship. Yeah. That's how I started in my Okay, yeah, so you started applying for an internship. How was that? while you're still in college or was that after college? Still in college. Still in college. And so uh, I understand that you've worked like, in the NLS office. You also have worked for uh, FIFA. Um, you know, and that took you back to Europe. Uh, so what was that like? And you know, you can just honestly just take me through like where you went first, what your next step was, and like what your thought process was. You know, now, I mean, it's, you will touch on it, Absolutely, uh, your role now in personnel and also you know helping out with what everything the crew is doing. Mm -hmm. But you can start from like, square one, your you know, your first job out of college, and then yeah. where it took you. We can go in order. So I was a senior. I was able to get a six-month internship uh, starting for, for January, so my last semester. So you get into the league office, and it's super competitive. It's 30 interns, all there for six months. And I remember we had some, some lunch with like the president of the company and he was asking, going around and asking, uh, introduce yourself, tell me where you, where you went and, and what major you're in. And everybody around the table were kind of bragging, you know, I went to NYU, I went to Cornell, uh, I went to Harvard. And my turn was that I was saying, I, I, I went to Delta University, but I said it proudly because I'm like, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to show you that it doesn't, doesn't matter where you went to school. What matters is what you do on a daily basis. So I had that mindset of, okay, I'm gonna work my ass off just because I wanna show that I'm, I'm not that I'm, I'm the best, but I deserve to be here as much as you guys. So I had a six month internship, and I guess I did a good job, and they extended me. We were only two out of the 30 that they extended. They extended me, and during that time, I, I was working with, uh, I was in the competition department, but I, I was working on a side project which was a partnership with the French Federation. And uh, the lead of, of that project was Tim Bezbachenko, uh, who's from here, Columbus, actually from Westerville. Uh, and he was the lead of that project. And at the end of the year, that was back in 2013, Tim Bezbachenko was, I think, 33 year old. And, and I mean, just to give them now, he's the GM of the crew. Yeah, so. GM and pre president of the crew now. But at 33 year old, he was hired as the GM of Toronto FC up in Canada, still in Major League Soccer. And he jokingly said, are you, jo are you joining me? I said, of course, call me and I, I join. And he called me and I, and I joined. So I, I went up in Canada with him. Uh, so just to give you a backstory, Toronto FC stopped starting MLS uh, back in 2007. And they hadn't made the playoff for six or seven seasons. So Tim was brought in to you know, build the team, build the culture, and he brought me on board. So I guess together we, we, we set the good, good basis for um, you know, core players, a new culture of winning, setting up the academy properly, all these things. And uh, I spent there two years. I left in 15, but then the team went to the finals in 16, and they won the championship in 17. So I didn't get a ring, but I still felt that I was part of it a little bit because the players that were there were some of the players that Tim and I brought in. And then, uh, so after two years, listen, to Toronto, I don't know if you guys have been to Toronto, but for me it's the best city in the world. It's, it's awesome. It's ridiculous. If you have a chance, please go during the summer or something because it's a great city. And I was, I was in love with the city. Everything was great. Uh, the, the club was great. Uh, but I had that urge to go home because I had been away from seven, for seven years and I had that urge to just go closer to my family. And uh, again, I wanted to work in soccer. 
uh, back home, but had you been in sports, I would take it, or even anything, I just needed to go home at that time. So I reached out to somebody that uh, was a vice president at MNS when I was an intern that I had a good relationship with, um, and asked him, listen, do you have any contact in Switzerland? So let me see, and he had a contact at FIFA. I'm like, oh, this is impossible, but let me try. So I'd apply a position at FIFA as a coordinator. Um, after three rounds, uh, I got the job. And the job was beyond what I was willing to do. It was ridiculous. It was essentially working on the World Cup, uh, the Russian World Cup in 2018. Uh, but at that time, I didn't realize what I, was, uh, what I signed up for. But I spent there three and a half years, and, and it's, it was incredible because you just it's, it's, it's the biggest organization in the world of soccer. It organized the biggest sports event in the world, and I, I was lucky to be part of that. Yeah, I know uh, you took some of those like, lessons and the things that you saw there on the, like, the biggest scale in the world. When you came back to Columbus, I know, uh, as far as not only personnel, but also with seeing the World Cup uh, creation, the different infrastructure for that, and then Coming back to America it had to have been hard to leave uh, when you want to return so badly. But um, you know, how was that process? Uh, meeting back up with Tim here in Columbus, where everybody here, you know, at least likes Columbus somewhat. Uh, but you know, a lot of us love it here. What drew you to come to Columbus specifically? And you know, how did that process start once you uh, had been at FIFA for over three years? Yeah, so, I mean, you guys, life is cycles. You know, something that you liked in high school, you may not like anymore now, and you're not going to like when, once you graduate. So, at that time, I had that urge to go home, but then I spent three and a half years in Switzerland, which was an hour drive to France, which was perfect uh, to my parents. Uh, but I spent three years organizing that World Cup. And one of my tasks was to, as you mentioned, to, to, to find a training base for our team and hotels. And um, it was incredible. And the World Cup, my country won it. France won the World Cup. <laughs> and I was on the field uh, when they won, when they lifted the trophy. I was in the locker room. I was, I, I was next to the president. I, I had both of, my, of the World Cup in my hands, et cetera, et cetera. Of the country? Of the country, yeah. Um, but I can go in detail later. But yeah. anyway, after that, that was it. The World Cup was over. It was the best thing ever. And now I was in charge of organizing the, the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. And I just didn't have that, that drive. It was just different. Russia was awesome. Qatar is just easy. It's just one city, essentially. And again, timing. I don't know if you guys are very familiar with what happened with the Columbus crew. Uh, the, the former owner wanted to relocate the team, so the team was about to leave Columbus, and the supporters fought, and um, kudos to them because without them there wouldn't be any club here. And um, end of 2018, new owners came on board, the Hassan, who owned the Kingdom Browns, and they hired Tim Bezbachenko as the, as the new president. And same thing that he told me a few years back, he said, are you joining? And, but he was joking even more because I was at FIFA, he thought, well, I will never leave. And I said, listen, call me and I'll come. And he did, and, and, and I came. And, and you know, when I tell people, hey, I'm leaving FIFA, I'm going to Columbus, they, you know, they think I'm a, I'm a fool. Why, why would you leave Zurich? Why would you leave FIFA to go to Columbus? The way they, they talk about Columbus is as if it's the worst city in the world, but I'm like, you don't know any better, I, I'm going, I know it's going to be great. And at the end of the day, it's working with people, I knew I was going to rejoin with, with Tim, and it was going to be awesome, so, so I decided to, yeah, to take a chance, and, and here I am. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, obviously the crew won the 2020 MLS Cup. Uh, what, what year did you join back with the crew? 19. So, you obviously were a part of that, uh, as was Tim and both of you, huge parts of that. Um, so once you were back at the crew, like 
This is our hometown team, and I'm from Columbus. Uh, not everybody here is, but now everybody uh, you know, is, a, in theory, a crew fan. So take us through like building this championship team. And then you, know, you can also get into the big story now is the new stadium, too. But obviously, the play on the field is what really matters. So mm. um, you know, how, how has it been as far as your position here? as the director of player personnel and strategy, which I believe is, is your title. Yeah, so. that's correct. So when Tim asked me, are, are you joining? I, I said, of course, because I knew what was going on. I knew what happened to the team, that it was saved. And it was the same feeling as, as what we experienced in Toronto, where it was something. It, it feels like a, a, an expansion team almost, a, a new team, a new birth. And at the same time, he told me, listen, this is an exciting project. The new owners have plans to build a new stadium, a new training facility, and given your background, you will be involved in that. So then I, I, I didn't hesitate a second. I joined. And my role essentially, and it hasn't really changed, but I'm responsible for uh, our roster. So you know, scouting, recruitment, signing contract, salary cap management, and strategy. Um, but at the same time, I had ad hoc projects, so such as building a new training facility, which is a 42,000 um, square a new building right next to our old stadium. And then for the new stadium, I was in charge of um, building the, just the, the soccer areas. But at the same time, I was also part of a team that was in charge of, of, of building a, a team. And it was similar to Toronto, where we had to build a core, a new culture, uh, add some pieces here and there, and we won last year. We won, we won MLS Cup last year. Uh, it was, it was uh, unbelievable. And I finally have my ring now. I didn't have it in Toronto, and now I have it. Uh, but it was, it was amazing. And once you win, you just want to win again. So this year is not going great, but we, <laughs> we're doing everything to, to turn things around. Yeah, that's sweet. Like, you know, I can't imagine for you a better position than being able to build, like, you know, I have some pictures up here. I think those are, like, more sketches than actual live pictures, but, um, you know, I've seen actual pictures of it, and mm -hmm. it looks phenomenal. And uh, how does that uh, position that you're in with personnel and strategy on a day-to-day -day basis, as far as, like, players and being in that facility, uh, or you know, building the team. Are you like uh, on like an out external perspective, like reaching out and uh, <coughs> scouting like yourself, or are you more like strategizing on what the team needs, or both? Uh, you know, as somebody who's in the position you are as the assistant general manager, it's, it might be some both or overseeing it. But like you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, what does it look like is with your interaction with uh, the team and the roster? So it is both. It is. It is. Um once you get the, the guys in your team, then you're kind of done. Uh, you have to plan for the future. So I'm part of a team uh, with our director of scouting, our technical director, to look for new talent because you need to keep improving every single year. But at the same time, what I do on a daily basis is, is I'm also part of the, the culture and the chemistry of the team. So I deal with players in the sense of just meeting up with them, making sure they have everything they need and just dealing with, uh, with the leaders of the team and to see what's wrong and, and what's going well. Same thing with coaches. Uh, so that's on, on, on a daily basis. But then on a daily basis, you also have to plan for the future. So it's like, even today, um, how does a new signing impact our salary cap for next year and for the years to come? Uh, all these things that have, yeah, you have to plan. Yeah, um, and you know, I know you've had experience uh, in Europe and now in America, and I know there's that's a little bit different. Uh, soccer is a sport here that's a lot newer on the, like the professional scene, and you know it's growing. Mm -hmm. um, you said you grew up, and it was the only sport that you, you watched. Uh, as far as like being in personnel, strategizing your roster, and also dealing with like the elements of a bigger league in Europe that compared to the MLS. Um, how do you go about, you know, finding a, a player and, you know, again, you know, there's the Crew Academy 
and I know our, I, I believe they're trying to expand that as yeah. well. Um, what is the, that process going to look like? And like, where do you see the MLS Academy system, stuff like that, as it starts to grow in America? What What do you envision for that? What are your hopes and your goals for the crew specifically too? I, I honestly truly believe that um, the U.S. would be one of the very best country in soccer. Uh, maybe not tomorrow, but soon. Just because, for example, those facilities, uh, they're like across MLS, and in Europe it's not the case. You still have obsolete uh, facilities, it's old. What's great here is the system of salary cap. I know people don't like it, but it, it, it keeps things in track. Uh, you have some clubs in Europe that spend money on new stadium, new training facilities, and because they, they don't have good finances, then they go bankrupt, and this doesn't happen here. Uh, on the question for the academy, I think that's, that's the growth of, of the sport, of, that's the future. Um, you see it now uh, with the US men national team, you have a lot of kids that went to MS academies. Our goal with the crew is to have more and more. We already have a few uh, kids that came through the academy. But the goal is just to have more, and how do you do that? You have to find them earlier, you have to make them feel, you know, fall in love with the crew, uh, with MLS. Uh, there's a term here when people say Euro, Euro snob is, is the, guy, the people that think you know, MLS is crap and, and soccer is crap, it's not called soccer, it's called football. But I want to tell those people that you need to watch games, it's, it's, it's getting better. It, MLS is not what it used to be 10 years ago. Um, in soccer in general, when I first came, it was 12 years ago, it was hard to find uh, soccer games on TV. You barely saw kids playing in the street. You couldn't find people wearing jerseys, and now it's not the case anymore. I mean, everywhere you drive, you have kids playing with soccer jerseys on, and, and games are on TV. Yeah, and I see it too. I think everybody does. You know, it's definitely growing. Uh, and I, you know, I definitely want to get to this part as well with you now being. And you know, I can imagine just a fun job to be able to do it. Uh, you know, with its uh, with its stresses for sure. I right? yeah. uh, But uh, you know, for my club and myself, and you know, we're all trying to break into the sports industry and go into sports business, whether it be um, you know, hopefully in like an executive role or a personnel role, such as yourself, or in communications and athletic training and journalism mm -hmm. and anything. Like, uh, you know, it's obviously a very competitive field, uh, and it's not as apparent as maybe, like, going into this or that, where there's feeder programs, and you kind of have to go outreach and do it yourself. Like, what, do you have any advice for the, here, the people that are here to, you know, break into, even if it's just specifically about the soccer industry, um, but, you know, what are some things that you notice that, allowed you to kind of get to where you're at, you are now as opposed to the people you're competing with. Yeah. Uh, first of all, the, the fact that you guys are here tonight is, is, tells a lot about you guys. It's, I mean, you're, you're, you're already serious about you know, wanting to learn more about other sports, about how to break into the industry. To your point, what, what, what is working in sports? It's, it can be like me on the front office side, but it's also working communication, working marketing, working in finance, all those aspects of sports, it, it, it is still working in sports. What I would recommend you guys to do is, you're fortunate to be at, at, at such a great school. Uh, my school was tiny compared to this. Uh, we didn't have as many sports as you guys do, we, we didn't have as many facilities as you guys do, so my advice would be to reach out already now to all the sports team that you have here. I don't think there's any small team, small sports, try to already be involved in whatever you do, whether it's in finance, reach out, whether it's uh, in marketing, reach out to, I don't know if you guys have a, I know, you know, uh, teams that people don't really care about, maybe you start there, that, 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 that'd be a good start. We, we didn't have that. So you're lucky, you're lucky to be, to be at Ohio State. Uh, but yeah, keep being interested, reach out, and don't be afraid, go for it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's great, and you know, we are fortunate to be at such a big 
school that cares about athletics. Yeah. We're also fortunate to have organizations such as the Crew, the Blue Jackets, uh, you know, the Clippers, uh, and then a lot of other teams in Ohio too. Uh, I know we're all going to be on our own search to try to find where our path is in the sports industry, but for somebody such as you to come and impart knowledge onto us tonight, I'm, we're very thankful for it. Um, I want to like see, is there any questions for Issa right now? Um, we'll have a little breakout session if there are any readily available. Uh, Cole, we can start. Who would, you, excuse me, who would you say is your biggest career mentor and what is the best advice they've given you? Uh, there are two. There are, I think Tim Bezvachenko is one, for sure, and because I've spent so much time with him and I see him operate. Uh, what he's done in his young career is pretty incredible in Toronto and in here. And it was in another one, um, Nelson Rodriguez, who was the vice president of, of, of the competition at MLS. And the biggest advice he gave me was uh, he used to say, do things right and do the right things. And it's, it's simple, it's, it's, you know, anyone can come up with this, but at the end of the day, he's right. Like, if you take your job seriously in everything you do, whether you're an intern or a part-time or full-time, if you do the right things and you do them right, then you can't have any regrets. And that's the big thing that I had personally, I had regrets looking back at my pro career, I'm like, I wish I had done more. I wish I had taken this more seriously. And maybe that was a good lesson, because now, even if I don't get something that I want, I can look at myself in the mirror and say, you know what, you gave your best, and, and that's all that matters. Hi, uh, I've always been one that has thought like the French football market has been like, an untapped area for like, MLS to like, get into. So you mentioned briefly about your like, you had like a project with MLS on like getting to France. Do you think can you, do you think, could you uh, explain a little bit about that project and do you think MLS is doing enough to like reach that market? Yeah, so that project was separate. That project was actually was an academy project. Uh, ten years ago MLS realized, listen, we are we have kids playing soccer, they're good, but then at one point they're they don't progress as much they realized that it was because of the coaches. The coaches were not good enough. They were still teaching the old way. So they looked around the world and they were looking for which country produces the most players. And there were two, it was France and Brazil. So they made a partnership with the French Federation in order to educate the US coaches so that they get better, so that they can uh, develop more players. So that was the reason. As for the French players, Fortunately, right now, and I'm saying right now because this is going to change, but right now, the French players still think not much about MLS. That, you know, they think, listen, it's going to be my, at the end of my career, I'll go there. And the issue with MLS, again, 10 years ago, it was, yes, they were getting a lot of old players, but that's no longer the case. So we need to change that mindset. But there are a lot of French players coming. I mean, the crew, we just signed one French player. Uh, who should be joining us soon. Uh, but yeah, great point. But the goal for MLS and for the crew is to not, not to rely too much on foreigners and try to have you know, local kids playing for us. Thank you. I like your jersey very much. Oh, thank you. I don't like your team though. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm a Chelsea fan. So if you were me right? I'm sorry, yeah. I'm kind of blind, so. No, tells the other way. So. We I couldn't hear you. Can you repeat it just one more time? Yeah, the twenty twenty six. It will, because all, all eyes will be on, on, on this country. So people will realize, oh wow, that's what they have. These are the stadiums they have. These are the, 
training facilities they have. The people are not blind, and thanks to social uh, social media, they know they know what we what we have here in this country. So there's a player, for example, a French player named Antoine Griezmann, uh, who's one of the best players in the world. who's playing for Barcelona uh, now for Atletico Madrid. He wants to come here. He's already stated it. He's going to come here. And there are more and more guys like this, and they're coming younger. And something that I forgot to mention for you guys, it's your generation. The 2026 World Cup is coming to, to this country. And that's a great opportunity for you guys, if you want to play and work in soccer, work in sport, to get involved with that event. Because, again, that's the biggest sports event in the world. Right now, everybody's focused on the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. But as soon as that is over, the focus will be on here. And there's so much opportunity just because you have whole cities, so you have 16 cities where games will be played. But on top of that, you have other cities where teams will train, teams will travel. It's going to be big, so that's a great opportunity for you guys to get in. Can you, uh, obviously, winning the MLS Cup has to be one of the highlights of your, of your career. Can you walk through what that moment was like when you finally realized, like, hey, we did it, we won, we're building this team back up? Uh, it was crazy. It was crazy because, obviously, it's been a crazy, it was a crazy year. So we started the season, we were in preseason in California. And from there, um, as I told you, I was working on the culture, the chemistry, and you could tell there was something with this team. And from there, we stated the goals to win MLS Cup. So we were playing great in preseason. We started off, uh, I think, at home against NYCFC, yeah, and we won one nothing. And then our second game was at Seattle. And COVID outbreak started in Washington State, if you remember. And we still traveled there, we played, and then we came back and then we shut down. And it was just like, my gosh, we were such on a great start. Uh, but it is what it is. So then we started again with MLS is back, which was a tournament in Florida, where we did really well. And then the season was kind of normal, whereby we were playing at home in a way, but there was no fans. And we had our ups and downs, uh, up until towards the end of our regular season where we pick it up a little bit, and then playoffs started. And our goal was just to have a one home game. Uh, and you realize, listen, you have just four games to win. You can go all the way. So we win all three games, and you just realize, hey, we're in the MLS Cup. The issue was that we were playing Seattle Sanders, which is arguably the best team in MLS over the past five years. And they're, they're super good. And the week leading up to that final, two of our starters, two of our best players uh, got COVID. So they didn't play. So all the odds were against us. Everybody was against us. Uh, uh, journalists, you name it. And we ended up smacking them. Three nothing. We killed them. And, and when you real, when the final uh, whistle is blown, and you just, you know, you can't believe it. You just won MLS Cup. It is, it's an unbelievable feeling. And it's a feeling that you want to repeat. So as soon as you win, yeah, you enjoy it a little bit, but you're like, hey, I like that feeling. I want to win again. So that's what we're aiming for. Uh, can you explain your day-to-day -day like or like inside the game? Right now? Uh, yeah, I'll walk you through right now just because we are right in the middle of the season. We are uh, not doing so well. I can, I can, I can list a number of excuses, uh, injuries, etc., etc., but it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you need to make the playoff and you need to win. And that's the, the hard part in sports is that when you win, everything is great. When you lose it, it's, it's a misery. And as athlete, as people that work in sport, you guys know that um, you win, your, your evening is great, you lose, it's terrible. And right now it's not great just because we expect more, we want more, the players know it. So my role on a day-to-day -to -day basis is, is just um, speaking with the players and coaches, 
making sure every, they have everything they need, just so that we don't, you know, there's no excuse. But on a broader scale is, is what can we do in order to win this season that is outside the players? What can we do in terms of uh, team building? What can we do inside the building to, to make everything smoother? But also already thinking of next year. Clearly there are things that are not working. There are position of needs. We need to scout now. Uh, and Kubin makes things difficult. But this whole next four months are going to be crucial because we need to be prepared for next year. What's the first thing you look for when you're scouting a player? The first thing I look for? It depends on the position, but many things. We break it down into four aspects. You have the physical aspect, technical, tactical, and mental. Uh, it depends on the need of the coach. He has a certain side of play, so he requires a certain type of player. So it really depends. I can give you an example. If you, uh, for example, for right back or full backs, our coach likes, it, likes them to go up and down, so you need someone that has good stamina, for example. And you need to have winners, too. Uh, that's something you look for. And some details when, when you watch a game on how they behave, how they react when, when a teammate mess up, uh, these are the little things that you look for. So, I was born in Belgium, so I'm not going to give you the answer in a while. But, knowing the culture of soccer in Europe, do you think that could be our advantage coming from the MLS and wanting to Wait, say it again, the second part? Like, knowing the culture of soccer in Europe, do you think that could be an advantage for working in the MLS and wanting to implement that idea here? Yeah, d definitely. Uh, it does help because, because you, 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 you live and breathe soccer when you own. Uh, it's everywhere. Here, sports is everywhere, but soccer is among so many other giants. But there is like the main thing. And you definitely bring something here. Uh, I think I do. Uh, and I think what I bring here is my experience as an academy player and as an academy, academy player that didn't make it. So when I speak to our young guys, when I speak to our coaches, I have a different uh, view uh, of someone that you know, tried but didn't make it and know why I didn't make it so I can you know, be an example for others. Uh, but also looking back, you know, to get some credibility because if I, if, I, if I speak to a young kid and say, hey, here I am, you should do this because I went through the same thing, he's going to look at me and say, yeah, but you didn't make it. But I can tell him, listen, but I played against some of the top players in the world right now and then they look at you, oh, okay, so that means you, you were pretty good. So, yeah, being from Europe helps for sure, uh, but that's not the end of it. You need to be adapted to. Yeah, so you said at one point um, that like you felt that uh, instead of just soccer, you would just sort of like take any job and sort of came to you when it came to like player personnel or uh, management. So not, like, let's just say that like you were um, someone like from the NFL was trying to get you to join a team. How uh, easy is that transition? Like because you have personal background of the sport of soccer and you play, how easy is that transition that if you wanted to go to be on the management uh, staff for like the NFL, do you think you would need more credentials or is it sort of just a job that you can sort of step into and you already have past credentials of marketing and management and you just sort of learn this, you just sort of learn the differences because there is differences in being on the management staff for the NFL compared to like MLS, it's different sports, different things that work. So is that like an easy transition from your past, you know, uh, degrees and credentials or something that you sort of have to learn while you're there? I would have to learn 100%. Uh, being in soccer, at that time when I said any sport, it was any, really any sport. And I would have learned, gone to NFL, learn NFL, gone to NBA, learn. But I think I, I wouldn't have thrived the way I, I do now just because this sport, I know it from since I was five. It's, it, I don't even think it's, it's in me. Now, if I were to go to NFL, I, I, I don't think I would excel as much as I do now. 
However, you can always transfer skill. Um, for example, we have guys on our staff that never played soccer before, but, and yet uh, one is a data analyst, uh, and he dissects plays for us, but he never played before. But he, he, he learned to learn the game of soccer. So if I were to go now to NBA and NFL, yeah, probably it would take me time. But again, work hard and, and learn. Be humble, adaptive, listen, and you can thrive in any sport, really. Let's go to the front first. Um, so I know America has been progressing a lot, but a lot, like a lot of people in the world, like the big things the World Cup, and America has not made it since 2014. So my question is, how do they progress like the rest of like a lot of countries in Europe that make it to the World Cup? How does America uh, get back to where they were in 2014 when so many people are excited to watch the World Cup? So, the World Cup is every four years. Uh, the U.S. have made the World Cup every single time, except for the last one. That was in 2018. But the U.S. are one of the best teams in the world. When they go to Europe and play Ireland or even Italy or whatever, they get good results always. Now, the World Cup is the biggest stage, so if you're not there, obviously you're, you're, uh, you're, you're seen as a failure. But I don't think that's the case for the U.S. It was a one-time thing. I'm sure they're going to make it in Qatar. Uh, obviously, they're going to make it when they're at home. But the fact that the academies are better, the pool of players is amazing. Now you have players, that, American players, that play in the biggest clubs in the world, which are Chelsea, uh, Juventus. I mean, they have the excuse to be one of the best teams in the world. So don't worry about the credibility. Like, people respect the U.S. Okay. So what college major do you think would be the most appropriate for your position now or position that you worked in the past? Do I say it again? What college major do you think would be the most appropriate for your position now or like positions you worked in the past? I want to say any. The, the reason why I'm saying this is, even right now, when I go through, uh, when I go through uh, uh, resumes for positions that we've opened, whether they're internships or even full-time positions, to be honest with you, I barely look at majors and I barely look at the school they went to. I'm looking at what have you done? What have you done while you were at school? What have you done as an intern? What have you done on your free time? But what have you done concretely? I don't care where you went to school. I don't care what major you've done. Uh, as long as you learn at school, you learn on your free time, and you go for it, you know what I mean? Like, you could be a business management major uh, with a 4.0, and you went to Yale. But at the end of the day, if you cannot do the job, and if you cannot interact, and if you are not, uh, forward-thinking, innovative, I'm not going to take you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> um, we can go first. Um, so I'm not too familiar with like soccer scouting, but how much do you guys use data in scouting players? Yeah, that's a good question. So, again, back to Tim Bezbachenko, our president. He was one of the first GM to heavily use data. Back in 13, when he was when in soccer, at least when you were mentioning data, uh, people would look at you and say, like, what, "What are you thinking about? Like, this is soccer. There's no data involved." But there is. So we use it uh, for tactics purposes, but we also use it for uh, scouting purposes. So we have models of to his question earlier, what are we looking when we scout players? We have specific metrics for specific position. So we use data heavily. And then we have rankings, and based on those rankings, we have a pool of players that people look for. And then, if they're available, we go for them because the data uh, back up our what we see with our app. Yeah, and just so you guys know, we'll take a few more questions here. It's getting near eight. Uh, yeah, Isa, are you I'm, good I'm for fine. One? You're fine. Okay, yeah, just wanted to make sure. So, uh, yeah, we can go. So we have, we have third, third party uh, software, uh, you guys wouldn't know about them. But what we actually just did, uh, we just hired a developer. 
So we plan on developing our own software internally to have all the data, whether it's performance, scouting, uh, salary cap, everything in-house under one platform. Uh, let's go you in the middle first. Yeah, you even have your hand up. How uh, is it to track for the international players? How what? How tough is it to attract the international players? Tough. <laughs> it's tough because you compete against the world. Uh, if you're Again, the Cleveland Browns, you look for a football player, that person will be in the United States, and that's it. You, so you scout to college, and that's it. And you always scout opponents, and you can make trades. For us, you compete against everybody. So in order for us to attract players, there are ways such as, hey, you're gonna come to a great country, a brand new stadium, a brand new training facility, you're gonna get paid on time, because at some, in some country you don't. And actually salaries are getting better here. So you might as well come here instead of going to elsewhere. But it, it, is, it is difficult. But that's where part of my role is, is recruitment. How do you sell uh, the US? How do you sell Columbus? How do you sell MLS to players that have no idea about it? So how hard was it? on the players and the team in general to not have fans in the stadium? Terrible. It was, I spoke about this recently with our captain, uh, because when we played Cincinnati at home, the crowd was incredible. And at the end of the game, he came up to me and said, this is what we missed. This last year was so tough, because we play, you play for the fans at the end of the day. You play you score goals and hear people screaming your name. You play for those emotions. And it was tough for them. And that's why it's a big kudos to them to, 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 to have won that championship. Because it, it was really, really difficult. Because in the hardest time, when you need to push, you need your fans. And that's the reason why we... I, have you guys come to the new stadium yet? No? Can you raise your hand? Who has come to the new stadium? <laughs> I honestly invite you to come watch a game. Uh, I don't know if you went to the old stadium or not, but this is just a different experience. It's, 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 I know you guys have the shoe, which is incredible, but watching a soccer game is something different. This stadium is just another level. It's one of the best in MLS for sure. So I invite you to come and, and experience that. And you realize why our players were missing those fans. So you're like the director of player personal strategy. So is there like sort of? I'm just wondering sort of the layout. Is there like a um, contract like staff under you, scouting staff under you, like salary cap staff under you that you sort of oversee and work with, or is there like a sort of like build up to like job titles that people sort of through promotion or experience they can build up? Like do you sort of oversee all that. Yeah, that's a good question. So no, we have so we have Tim Vesbachenko as our president and GM, uh, and then underneath him it's myself. It's our director of scouting, director of performance, and for me, I manage on my own the salary cap, uh, the projections, uh, the budget, and I oversee analytics uh, and our new developer actually for that platform. Uh, do you think MLS should switch to a uh, fall to spring schedule, or do you think it's just fine the way it is right now? <laughs> Sensitive topic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think they should. I think they should go and replicate uh, the calendar that is around the world because it limits us. It limits us to get players. It limits us in, in many aspects. But I also understand it. You have to to understand that. MLS competes as well in the country with NHL, NBA, NFL. I mean, NFL and NBA cannot compete, but NFL, uh, MLS competes with NHL mainly and MLB because 
they see the stats and there are less and less people following baseball and hockey and they're gravitating towards soccer, especially the, the youth population. So if you change calendar, it's, you, need, you need to find a, a spot for your TV schedule. And there's many implications, but I've been in favor of yes, changing the schedule. Here we go. Let's go last question here, just get near eight, but here we go. Um, so do you think the MLS should replicate Europe with like a relegation system in different leagues? No other sensitive topic. <laughs> no. Because MLS should remain as the North American League. This is the great thing about uh, football and basketball, there's no pro relegation. So I don't see why we should do everything European or stay American, do the American way, because it does work. And also the reason why I'm saying this, for example, the club that I went to when I was young uh, was in the first division. So at the very top, playing against Paris, against Lyon, against Marseille, against the biggest players. But then he got into financial troubles and they went down all the way to the fifth division. And that city is the fifth biggest city in France, and yet they didn't have a professional team because they were relegated. <laughs> um, so I, I don't see why you would have this here and have, say, a big city such as Columbus or New York, and because of bad results for one season, they get relegated, and then now that town doesn't have a city to watch. So I like promotion and relegation back home, but for here, I like the way it is because it's an American league. All right, all right. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, thanks for all the questions, everybody. Um, we're going to wrap it up. You guys can uh, hang out, come to, around in the front, uh, and I'll, we'll talk to you. And Issa will stay here for, I think, a couple more minutes. but. Uh, we really appreciate you guys coming out. Uh, we do have a meeting in two weeks with a couple of the associate athletic directors here at OSU, which uh, will most likely be in this exact same room. Uh, we really appreciate the turnout. You know, we couldn't be more thankful for you to come here, and we will have uh, Tim actually coming later in the awesome. semester. Um, so, uh, like he said definitely get out to a crew game and we're definitely going to set up something here for the club for coming out to the crew to watch you guys because uh, we definitely want to support. So uh, let's give it up for Issa guys.